Um, so today we'll be learning about how to leverage the bulk import in Wildbook. This is wildly useful, especially for those who are processing large amounts of data. Um, since we're all here, I'm assuming you have a base understanding of what the bulk import is, but um, we're gonna go over it just to provide some definitions and baseline understanding. The bulk importer gives you the ability to upload many encounters and the related metadata at once. An encounter is defined as a single animal at a specific time and place. So you can have a sighting which has multiple animals in it, or you can have an encounter which has a single animal in it. Um, and the difference between an animal and an animal is any body that you see within the photograph. Um, and then individual is another term that we'll be using. An individual is an animal that has been identified as a unique entity. Um, bulk import also uh, now allows you to manage any imports for detection and identification. Detection being the process that generates the bounding boxes around an animal, so that dashed line box that appears in your encounter page. Um, identification is the process where we compare that animal to other animals in the system and create a match score, which you then use to figure out who the animal is and if they've been cited before. When should you use the bulk import? Um, there, anytime you want to, typically if you have 20 or more images that you have the metadata for and you want to process them all at once, it's not a bad idea. Some major use cases for when to use it are if you're uploading a historical catalog, so you have a massive amount of data that isn't in the system that you want in there. Same thing if you have just come off a of field season and you're trying to process that season's data, you can do it in bulk. Or if you are part of a research collective or a university and you have a new researcher who's coming in with data already, the bulk import makes it easy to set up their account with their data associated with it instead of them having to process it one by one. I'm sure there's other use cases. I'm sure you all have thousands of them, but those are, those are some of the big ones that we see the most often. Um, to successfully uh, upload in bulk, you need three things. First, you need an account on Wildbook. Um, this should be either researcher, org admin, or admin level. If you have an account and somehow aren't able to do this, then that means we've messed up your permissions and you should come to the community and we can help you with that. Um, then you'll need your data and your metadata. This will be in two formats. The data will be a folder of photographs and the metadata will be in a spreadsheet. Um, I'm gonna run you through how both of these look and what it looks like getting it into the actual system. We'll start with what it is to upload images. Um, the things that you need are your photographs in a flat folder structure. That's something that looks like this. So you don't want folders inside of folders inside of folders um, if you're doing bulk import. There are ways for us to maintain that structure, but that's something that we do. If you're uploading it yourself, then you want it to, to be flat and understandable. So you may want to break it up into multiple imports if you want to maintain that grouping. Um, you'll also want to make sure that each file name is unique, and that needs to be to your account, not just in the upload. So for example, here, all of my images are uniquely named. Um, most of them follow a specific pattern because of how the photographs were generated. But let's say I was pulling in one additional photo for another researcher who used a different uh, naming scheme. I would also want to make sure that that uh, was distinct from everything else in the list. Once you've gone through and you've made sure that everything is distinct here, you would log into your Wildbook. Um, let me pull that up right now. So I'll be working in the Zebra Wildbook. Um, let me sign in real quick. Uh, so once you're signed in, you'll want to go to the bulk import page. It's found under submit. 
And here you'll have the high level instructions that we provide. You're also able to download the large form template that we have. This template has pretty much all of the fields that you're able to use. Um, it can be a little overwhelming. Some of the fields may not be applicable. For example, there are fields related to being in water. And if you support a terrestrial species, you're probably not going to be noting the depth of the encounter. But um, the good news is you can delete anything that you find in that template. Um, but that's just there for your reference. You don't need it right now. What we're going to do right now is we're going to go to upload photos. So here you go ahead and you browse to wherever your photos are located. Mine are in all the zebra things under the training set. Um, and it's going to pull in all of the images that are within that folder. So you can't go through and pick and choose. You, you want to make sure that the folder has everything that you're planning on uploading. Once you validate that, yep, that's what you're looking to upload, you go ahead and click begin upload. Um, these are going to process as they upload. You'll get a green indication as they complete. If something goes screwy, then you won't get a green indication and you'll know that it's not working exactly as anticipated. Um, this can take quite a while, um, but you can also upload in multiple sessions. One of the nice things is that the upload process for photos is distinct from the associating of metadata. And what that means is after you've uploaded photos, you can come to this photo review page here, which you can access through this link or once the full list is populated or once it's uploaded all of them, it'll also be prompted to go to that via another link. Um, so I'm going to wait for most of the way through the list. So I'm just going to let it finish processing so you guys can see that prompt that shows up. I probably should have done like three less images and timed it based on my speech, but you know, if you live, you learn. <laughs> so it automatically redirects you. Um, here you'll see all of the images that were uploaded. If you had other images that you had uploaded through the bulk import process, you would see those in the list as well. Um, I recently did a massive cleanup, so I don't have anything in here. I wanted to have a clean training set, but let's say that I had had data from a set where it said DSCN 1000 through 1005, those would all still be in this list as well. Um, and that happens every time you come back and look. So that's why you need to have something in, that is unique to your account because this list will contain all of the images that you upload going forward. The nice thing about that is when you click accept and move on, you can do the spreadsheet import for a subset of the images and the other images will like still be there when you want to come back and do it again. So you can do it use case by use case or whatever you have time to fill out, you can get that done in one shot and then come back and do it again. Um, are there any questions at this point? Um, yeah, I actually have a question. So um, I understand having a unique file name for that folder of images, but you're mm -hmm. saying that it has to be if I over time have uploaded 20 different folders from 20 different days that the file name has to be unique for all 20. Is that correct? Yes. And the reason for that is um, the system has no way of knowing what the image is except by the, the file path. So if you upload with the same name, we'll take your new picture and we'll replace your old one. Okay, thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Cool. Um, so we now have images in the system, we can go ahead and move on to our different use cases. Um, I'm going to present the three most common that we have right now. 
which are the minimum import. You just want to get your data in there. You want it to be a functioning encounter. You want to be able to match against it and have an idea of where and when it happened. Um, then we have the marked individual base matching catalog. Uh, this essentially means that you want to create a really, really solid idea of a single individual and you're not going to associate it with a specific place in time. This is useful if you have a catalog that's not necessarily oriented at marker capture. It's more oriented at knowing who a animal is and you're starting to move into the marker capture um, methodology. So I'll explain that a bit more as we delve into that specific one. Um, we'll also go into sighting based. A sighting, as I mentioned before, is multiple animals in a single time and place. So this is particularly beneficial to social species such as zebras um, and it allows for uh, observations of the group as a whole as opposed to doing um, things animal by animal. So more useful in terms of making notes of the ecology concepts like if you wanted to note things about how animals were interacting or the number of them beyond the actual represented within the images. Um, we'll go ahead and start with the minimum import. Um, if you have the spreadsheet, go ahead and open it and we'll work through it. Um, you'll notice two tabs in yours. You'll have one that says minimum and one that says explanations. Explanations is a short overview of what each one is and what it does. This is available in each one of the spreadsheets that I've provided. So you shouldn't have to necessarily go and delve into the wiki for what's in the sheets to start with. Um, all right, so processing this, what you would do is you would pick the images that you want to go into your import. So I've chosen 2216, which is this one, and 1999, which is this one. Um, I've, I've got reasons, so we'll look at them specifically. Um, this is a single animal in a single picture. It's pretty much the, the most basic use case you can have. Um, so what I did was I established that that's the picture name, and then I put the picture name under encounter.mediaasset. Um, media asset always has a number at the end of it, and it starts with zero and then increases by one the more of them that you add. This is only if you add multiple in a row. We're not doing that right now, so I'm not going to delve into it too much. I am going to delve into it later. Um, but that's why the zero is there. If, if you're only uploading one, then you, you only need the field to look exactly like this. Um, after that, you want to indicate species. Species is one of the things that we use to uh, uh, reduce the number of pictures that you're matching against within the system. That way a processing job will only look at animals that are relevant and it reduces the amount of time it takes, it reduces the load on the system, and it gets you your results faster. Split into two uh, fields. We've got genus. Genus is always capitalized. Specific epithet, which is always lowercase. Um, Make sure you spell it correctly. It's If you get the species incorrect when you put it in, then it won't be matching against anything because we won't know what the animal is. Um, you'll want to put in a time. The time can be as specific as you're able to get. We accept down to seconds, um, or it can be as big, as broad as you're able to identify. So if you've got a catalog where you can only get as specific as the year because you weren't collecting that data at that point, you can just put in the year and that will be viable. Um, basic expectation is to get year, month, day. That's really common in terms of what is collected. Um, you input these as numbers. Um, month is it starts at one and goes to 12. So here I have it just, I have this encounter set to be August um, 20th in 1997. 
Um, after that, you want to get a location. There are three different ways to input location. Um, the one that we encourage the most is location ID because that actually does something within the system. Location IDs, if you're um, familiar with them, let me pull up an encounter. So we here are the different fields for a location. Um, you can have a verbatim location like this, which you just enter in text. It is there, it's searchable, but it doesn't really like compare anything within the system. And then there's location ID. This is a hierarchical set of locations that the community generates. And you know, you come to us, you say, hey, I've started a new research project. I'm going to need Impala West and Impala East. And we would go in and we would add those into this. Um, the hierarchy can get as deep as five, any more than that, and the list becomes kind of unwieldy and hard to look at. So we encourage you to kind of keep it as broad um, categories. When you select a location ID, that gives us a way to restrict the location that we're comparing against. So if you are working with a species that has a really, really wide range of impact, but they have a really, really small location within their life. For example, um, there are like leopards exist in multiple sites around the planet, but they tend to not move outside of their range of a couple hundred miles. Um, you can set the location ID and then you're going to be comparing only against the populations that are relevant to your matching set. Um, if you don't set location ID, we don't restrict it, and you get a much, much bigger, broader range. So if you are working with animals that are kind of all over the place, then that might be more useful, like if they have a really wide travel range. But typically, setting the location ID gets you faster results and more accurate results. Um, Oh, when you're figuring out the notation for a location ID, you want to look in the wild book the way that I just did. Um, you'll want to come to either the submit page or you can look here on the encounter page and you'll just want to copy it exactly as it appears. You don't need to represent the hierarchy at all. Um, so you wouldn't need to write like Kenya dash Impala or anything like that. Um, but you do need to match it exactly as that field is represented within it. So you would need to do impala.central. I recommend that you go and look within the wild book that you work in because different organizations want different notation in the way that they put it in. Some people, they keep it as a flat list, but they want hyphens between it to get the same sense of hierarchy. There's a lot of different ways that it's done. So strongly encourage you to not guess because if you guess, then it's not going to match against anything. Um, the last thing that you want to put in is the submitter ID. Um, the submitter ID is who the encounter belongs to. So if you're setting up an account for a new researcher and you're trying to populate all of the data under them, you would put in their username. Um, if you don't want the encounter to belong to anybody, if you want it to be publicly available, then you don't need to enter anything. And if all of your data is publicly available, you don't need to use the field. Um, this is pretty standard if you're doing manually gathered information. Um, the other common use case is if you're pulling from EXIF data that is found in the photograph. So if you've been told that the GPS and the time are in your picture, then we're talking about EXIF data. Um, this is a sheet that has that information instead. It looks very different because it's what a computer is generating in order to find it. Um, date in milliseconds is milliseconds since the beginning of the era or something like that. And as you can see, it's just like a really big long number that you should definitely be copying and pasting because there's no way to not get typos doing this manually. Um, 
decimal latitude and longitude or your EXIF data, it could be in decimal, it could also be in the degrees format. Um, you'll need to handle that conversion if it is being presented in degrees. But once you have the conversion done, it can just come in here for, and you input the latitude and the longitude, and then we calculate the location from there. Um, the big thing to remember here is um, if you're able to copy and paste these values in or do a double check before you upload checking for negative signs because otherwise your animal can end up in a different country and it will be lost and confused and not know why it's in Siberia when it actually lives in Tanzania. So just keep an eye out for issues like that. Um, I think that's it for the minimum setup though. So does anyone have questions about what you input, where to find it, anything like that? Hi, Tanya, I have a question. Cool. Um, maybe I missed it since I'm multitasking with my child's school, school work here, but um, is the location a required minimum or can that be left blank? Um, it's considered a requirement for having a full encounter. So what we define as an encounter is an animal at a specific time in a specific place. So any form of location, any form of date are considered required for the encounter to be complete. You can successfully upload without them, but that wouldn't be specific to your use case if you were trying to do it. Like um, when we go through the individual catalog, we won't be providing that information and there's a reason why. But if you're trying to do the general matching process, we consider it to be, if not a requirement, then best practice. Does that make okay, sense? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hello, I've got a question, please. Yeah, what's up? Um, regarding the, the um, EXIF data, Mm -hmm. um, are those are those fields set in the bulk uploader? Can they be customized? And if they can be customized, is there any limit in what we can we can do with it? I'm not sure what you mean by fields. But okay, can, so we hmm, go ahead. Um, you can set up the spreadsheet to have whatever you want in it, um, mm -hmm. as long as it's a supported field. So the website the link that I provided here, this has all of the fields that are available that you can put in there. So if you want to okay. add more, take more away, you can do that. I'm kind of going through the minimum because we only have an hour and there's a lot. But um, yeah, you can customize it with whatever. And if you wanted to include, you know, multiple forms of location, you can. If you wanted to include comments, you can. But you just have to follow the format that's within the wiki. Super, thanks. Cool. Anyone else? All right. Um, we're going to go ahead and do a bulk upload of this information since we've got it here. Um, I do need to change this because I realized that I was using the wrong account. So let me save that real quick. Uh, that's an important thing. Make sure that you're actually sending it to the right user. <laughs> Um, all right, so we're here and I'm going to go ahead and browse to my desktop where I have minimum import with data and we'll begin the upload. It went pretty quick because there's only two fields in it. Um, as you can see, everything is, well, potentially as you can see, if you don't have red green color blindness then um, everything was successful we currently only have color indication of what the what is imported successfully or not that's something that we're looking at accessibility wise um, but what the color indications mean are pretty straightforward um, green it worked we have a recognition of what you did if you we're trying to reference an image, you reference something that existed in the system, all of that. Blue indicates that there was 
a field found, but there was nothing in it. So this can happen if you accidentally press space in a field or something. Um, yellow indicates that a field was not present or that nothing could be determined. What that typically means is something was input kind of weird um, or that we're not parsing things correctly is usually when I see it. Um, so if you're getting yellow or if you're getting red, those are things where you probably want to double check your data or reach out to us on community and get help for what's going on. Um, red means that you're getting an actual error. These I most commonly see under media asset and it's if you've referenced an image that doesn't exist in the upload. Um, they can occur in other places, but that's mainly when you'll see it. And if you see red in the encounter media asset, you'll just want to go back and review your data and get assistance with that if you can't figure out where something's wrong. Um, all of mine's working. All of it's what was expected. I didn't want to submit an idea on this one, so it doesn't have one. It does here, so we're good. Um, once you've got all of that done, you want to click commit these records. Um, this warning is much more important if you're doing a large scale import. Um, we recommend doing no more than a thousand at a time. It will let you, but it might time out and stop working. So keep it to a thousand or less is best practice. Um, we'll click OK. You get the little spinning wheel that indicates the processing and we successfully did it. Um, once it takes you here, you'll be able to review your import task. Um, this is accessible at any time under administer bulk import logs. And you'll see the full list of all of the imports that you have access to. If you're a researcher, you'll have access to only your own. If you're an org admin, you'll have access to yours and all users within your organization. Um, if you are a site admin, you'll, you should have access to all of them. Um, we only allow reporting of the past um, two months, 60 days, and it is something that you'll still be able to go and find them throughout the platform, but active management of something in a bulk capacity really shouldn't be happening unless the data is fairly new, is kind of our logic on that. Um, once you go in, you have some options of what you can do with it next. Um, you can send all of the images to, de to detection. That creates the bounding boxes that we talked about. Um, or you can send them to identification. If you send them to identification, that completes detection first and then identification, which can be a heavy load if you're doing a large amount of images. It can take over the queue for a long time. You can kind of lock up things for other people. So it's something where we try to keep that uh, we make recommendations about like when you should do it regarding, you know, your local times, who all's on your platform, double check with people if anyone else is doing large imports or management. There's, you know, basically do unto others, be nice, don't take up the whole queue if you don't have to, it's kind of the goal. Um, with that, if you're doing identification and you're working specifically within one region, um, go ahead and click that one. If you want to match against all regions, you can do that as well. Just be mindful that that is a bigger processing job. Um, that's one of the reasons why we recommend doing smaller imports where the data is more consistent between them. If all of your data is from Impala Central, then you can just do ID against Impala Central and it won't be an issue. Um, if you're pulling in data from all around the world, then you'll probably want to run ID against all locations. Alternatively, you can send them to detection only and then you're able to kick them off from, you're able to kick off detection one by one on the encounter pages. If you're working with a new student who is like, 
going through the process really manually because they're becoming familiar with what it is to do identification, that can be a good way to reduce the load on the system and give them an opportunity to learn at their pace because the bounding boxes will be there. They can click match and they'll be able to follow through the process a lot more specifically. Um, it's just one of the ways that you can do it, I suppose. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and send to identification, um, send to IA, it may take a long time, click okay, because I recognize that I'm only doing two and no one's actively using this platform right now, so I can go ahead and do that. Um, and that's pretty much it. You'll be able to navigate to the specific encounters via the bulk import, or you can search for them. Um, as detection is running, you'll get the normal notifications that it is still in process. Um, the last thing that's important to note is if you import via bulk import, you'll be able to see that notation here on the metadata tab, and you'll be able to link directly to the import log. So like I said, while the log, it only shows 60 days worth, you'll still be able to see the older ones if you encounter something where it doesn't seem like it was uploaded quite right and you're just finding it, you can click in and review the data and mass and see if there's anything that you need to do management wise. Um, one last note regarding the detection and identification buttons for the bulk import. If you have anyone start doing identification one by one where they come in and they click it from this location instead of doing it in bulk, you'll no longer be able to like bulk send off the rest of it. So it's definitely something where you wanna weigh how you wanna handle it and then handle it that way from the get go. Does that make sense? Does anyone have questions about the upload process? Hi, Tanya, uh, I've got a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, imagine some imports have started individually, uh, mm -hmm. so doing them one by one by upload and encounter, the nice simple way. Mm -hmm. And I now want to accelerate the process and do a bulk import. Um, imagine there is an overlap in some in one of the images I put in the bulk imports and one of the images that have already been done i'm not sure if this is what you're talking about will that crash system or do i have to take special care for that not to happen um, or it, will it kind of like override that error and just replace the image if you see what i mean i'm pretty sure i get what you're saying uh let me just <laughs> double check if you were doing the one by one system and yeah. you had an image that was you know, zebra herd one, and then you decided to do bulk import and there happened to be one that was also called zebra herd one. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the, the same one, but being uploaded for the second time. Right. Um, it's going to overwrite the image, but it will not cause an error or crash anything or anything like that. It will just treat it as basically an image refresh of what was there previously. And so the new image will be associated with the previously created encounter. And so if there's uh, more than one image per individual, that's an option, right? You can put more than one image for an individual in an encounter. Yes. That's in the media asset zero, one, two, three. Would it add to those maybe? Um, I'm not sure. JH, are you still on the call? Yeah, actually I wanted to, to jump in. I was just waiting for a good point. So awesome. I want to separate in our discussion um, the idea of bulk import as being a place for photo storage and then the actual imported encounter. So when we bulk up, upload, and this is what largely Tanya has been talking about, we're taking everything you've ever given us and we're putting it, we're dumping it in a giant folder. That is a, a temporary storage space. So if you give me photo 12345.jpg, we put it in bulk import, we upload your spreadsheet. When we run the bulk importer, we're actually going to copy that file into its, that, that, all your photographs into specific directories elsewhere in Wildbook. 
So what we're looking at here on the screen is just this, this dump folder that's meant for, here's all the full files that you've bulk imported before. Here's the new ones that you just imported. We have access to all of them. When we actually go through the import process, we're gonna copy them into separate folders. Thereafter, they exist as data that you're not going to overwrite. If you come back here and upload something with the same file name, it's going to overwrite in this dump folder that file, but it will not overwrite it in the rest of, it won't cascade to things that you've imported before. So you absolutely can have, you know, shark1.jpg, zebra1.jpg, and later in time, zebra1.jpg may be from your 2020 data now, and you also had a zebra1.jpg from your 2018 data. Your 2018 data is unaffected. You can upload um, uh, shark1.jpg or zebra1.jpg now. It will overwrite it in this folder. Your bulk import will run and copy it into a separate area. So we do not overwrite historical data that has successfully gone through the bulk import process. Now, interestingly, if you go to the image analysis side when we start running our machine learning, we do actually find out that those two images, which now safely exist in separate folders after going through bulk import, we do actually figure out that they're the same image. And if things are found in those annotations, we also figure out, well, wait a second, we found the same fluke or the same zebra at the same point in the image that we saw before. So there is some intelligence that happens downstream, but right now we're talking about bulk import and bulk import will not uh, overwrite previously bulk imported data. Thanks for the clarity, Jason. You had me worried for a minute there. No problem. So is everyone good with that? Any additional questions? I have one more, Tanya. Can you just clarify again what the best, um, like where to find the locations to put in the encounter location ID column? Yes, um, there are two places. One is under submit report and encounter. So the main page that we're used to seeing um, where mm -hmm. it says, was this one of our location IDs? You see the list here. Um, the other spot is on, on mm -hmm. a specific encounter page. So I'm going to go over here and it's under edit location ID and you can see the list there as well. So whichever one of those is easier. Typically, um, we recommend the report and encounter page because that is what everyone has access to, whether or not you have an account. So if you have a citizen science side and you're encouraging people to just upload, that's where you would look, but that's not really relevant to people doing bulk import. So it's really up to you. And um, in that list, there's various hierarchies. So can you put any level of it? Like for example, in the North Atlantic, could I choose the whole North Atlantic versus something more specific like the Gulf of Maine? You can go as broad as you want to. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. And there's, uh, we have three senses of location in Wildbook. And they, they really are along the spectrum of, you know, uncertain human-based reporting. You know, I was five miles off Pier 1 near Florida. Um, that's the verbatim locality, literally how you'd describe it to a friend. Um, there's the location ID, which is what uh, Tanya has been showing, which is hierarchical. This is us trying to enforce a hierarchical structured view of where was I, and it's the, it's the compromise between human readability and machine exactness. Uh, and then we have GPS coordinates, which are incredibly exact, but oftentimes not reported. Um, and so those are the, the three senses we're trying to get across. And so location ID, we very much try to keep a 
structured vocabulary to allow us all to have a common sense of where and to make that matchability more exact rather than you know sort of hunting on keywords as people describe things or relying on GPS coordinates, which might be missing. Um, I had another question based on location as well. I feel like this might be a good time. Um, so at some point you said that uh, because it might make the list unmanageable, uh, mm -hmm. you recommend five sub-locations. Um, no. Um, no? I missed it. I may have said that. That isn't what I meant, though. Um, okay. We only want it to go five deep in terms of hierarchy. So in this list... Um, Ah, that's not what I want to do. Uh, right now it's three deep. It goes Kenya, Impala, Impala okay. North. If you, you know, wanted it to go down to, I, I honestly don't know how I would do this to make it six deep, but. Oh, no, I, I understand what you mean. Okay. Yeah. I know, I understand. And, and for example, I, I know we've sent some locations to you um, for the regular survey sites that we use. Yes. Um, imagine uh, there's one that isn't part of the list that is already in this set location ID. Um, would we have to contact you to put it into one of the potential locations or is there a way around it so that we don't have to? So it's kind of a mix. Um, you can put it in and it will hold that information, but we will not recognize it until we put it in like it won't show up in the list. Um, this is, part of that is to enforce spelling and those kind of things because we get a lot of random typos of people going too fast. And so they'll be creating 40 test sites that are actually one single test site and there's just weirdness between them. So we try to keep it as an enforced list. If you want it to appear in the dropdown, you need to contact us. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, best way to do that is through community. I know I keep bringing it up, um, but community.wildbook.org. This is where we do all of our support tracking and stuff. And we're going through a lot of these things pretty quickly. Um, if you're just adding a location, that's something that any one of us can do. And so it'll get taken care of probably same day as soon as we see it. All right, so we post our request for a new location in the community. Yep. Cool. Okay, thanks. Yeah, for sure. Any other questions? All right, um, I'm gonna go into our other spreadsheet use cases and then um, we have some common pitfalls that I wanna touch on before we finish up. I will be making the PowerPoint and this recording available online. So anything we don't get to, you'll still be able to poke through on your own. Um, so we'll start with the individual, or we'll move on to the individual catalog. Um, this is, uh, use case I mentioned where we're not going to include location, we're not gonna include time. Um, what this looks like is you have um, an individual where you have a number of pictures for them and you want them all associated with that individual but you don't have the related encounter data. By adding all of those pictures together in a single encounter, you create a really, really strong sense of identity within the system for the system to match against. So this is highly recommended for uh, solo animals where they tend to be off by themselves and you're not gonna have multiple animals within a single picture. And it's uh, adding them in to a single encounter gives you that matching basis. Um, we mainly see this in new wild books or people who are introducing a new species or something like that, but it is, it's still something that people think to do. Um, so this is the scenario and let me see if I can make this more legible. 
ha. Okay, now I can see everything. Um, we have two images of the same animal and we want them associated in the same encounter. We have to add additional media assets. So encounter.media asset zero for the first picture. Then we want to add an additional one. That would be encounter.media asset one. Um, you could go as many as I would say up to a thousand, and that would you would want that to be your only upload. Um, but as many pictures as you have, go ahead and put them up and put it into a single one. Um, if your organization makes notes on the photographs themselves, such as determination of quality or features that are seen within a picture or anything like that, we recommend that you put those into the system as keywords. Um, keywords are associated with a given photograph and using this option, encounter.mediaasset.keywords. You can put in as many keywords as you have and uh, do it in a single field using a comma delimited list. So we have three keywords here, tail, comma, tall grass, comma, high quality, and those are all valid. Um, so like the space gets recognized and it's, it's not gonna mess anything up. It, it will take those as three keywords. Um, because we're creating an individual catalog, we want to associate these images with an, in, a marked individual. Um, you provide the name of the individual. This can either be one that already exists in the system. I have a zebra in the system named a team of dancing penguins. It is largely named that, so nobody accidentally matches against it, but also because I think Mary Poppins is great. Um, I'm going to associate these two images with that individual. Uh, you want to include the species for sure if you're doing an individual catalog because you're creating representatives of a species within the wild book. I'm gonna update that to be my actual um, account that I've been using instead of the one that I have on Foodbook. And then we would just come back over this one. Too many tabs. There we go. Um, we would come back to the bulk import and we would go through the same process again. Um, we're running low on time, so I'm not going to step through that unless people want to see the results for it. No? Okay. Um, we'll jump to the last one, which is the citing import. Um, there are two different use cases for citings. Um, in terms of how you associate the information. One is if you have single animals in a picture, but they were all taken in the same viewing. Um, reviewing the pictures that I have here, each one of these pictures is a single animal that was standing around, but I saw them all the as part of the same herd. I was able to get up, take good pictures of them without spooking them, and I managed to get individuals within the sighting. So I'm going to treat that as a single um, a single sighting and put all of the animals in together. So what I do is I reference the images individually, associate the metadata that I want to have with it, such as the location, the species, the time, if I had included it. And then most importantly, the occurrence ID. Um, major source of confusion for people is we have two words for one thing. Occurrence was the old word for a sighting. Um, we're shifting to sighting. It's more understandable. That's all that's going to be referenced in next gen. We're cleaning up front end to make that happen, but we can't change that over in the database. So just try to remember that an occurrence is a sighting and a sighting is multiple animals at a single time and place. And Hopefully that will make this make sense. Um, occurrence ID is something where you can reference a sighting that is already in the system, or you can create a new one. Um, if you reference something that is already in the system, it will add the 
images and the encounter to that sighting. If you reference a new one, you will create a new one. You do need to provide the occurrence ID on every encounter that you want to go into that sighting. Um, there are certain fields that you can see within a sighting that you're able to update. Um, just go into the wild book and navigate to a sighting and you'll be able to see which ones you're able to edit. Um, those are the ones that you're able to change. Some of them are on all platforms such as group behavior and individual account. Some of them are not such as water depth and those kind of things. So check your wild book, work off your wild book. That will tell you what you have to work with. Um, the other use case is if you have a social species and um, in this example with zebras, we have a whole herd and we're going to send this in. What that looks like is you upload a single encounter and you apply the information that applies to every animal within that encounter. So if they're all of the same species, they're all at the same place, you want them all in the same sighting, you include that. And then when you send it through to detection, it's going to find the multiple animals in the picture and it's going to create a new encounter for each one of those that it finds. It'll copy the metadata and associate that with each one of those encounters, which is why you want to only include information that you want populated across all of the encounters. Does that make sense? Sounds like a yes. Okay. I'm going to update the spreadsheet that is available on the wiki to include both of these scenarios also. Right now, the one that's on there, it only has the single animal one, but it it's pretty straightforward as long as you treat the two cases very distinctly. Either upload multiple animals in a single picture or single animals and reference them individually. Um, last thing are common pitfalls. I've been hitting on this as we go, um, but typos are a big deal. We don't do a lot of processing of what's going in, so make sure that you're checking for file extensions to be exact on your media assets. If it's all caps in your file folder, it should be all caps in your spreadsheet. If JPEG is JPEG, you have to include the E. Um, location, you have a couple of different things that you want to make sure of. For latitude and longitude, you want to double check your conversions. If you're coming out of degrees and going into decimal, just make sure. And check for minus signs. That's a really big deal. Location ID, um, checking that the format match extent matches exactly. We've covered that pretty extensively. You definitely need to contact us to add new location IDs though. Um, we'll also be able to help you figure out if one already exists and there's a typo, like if you uploaded one and you thought that it would be associated with the location ID and you can't find it, we can help you track that down. Um, taxonomy is complicated. One of the things that I recommend if you are creating a template for other people to use, we do recognize drop downs in the Excel sheet. Um, Gianna, you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Tanya. Um, it was just, you mentioned that um, minus signs in the lat longs were a big deal. And I just wondered if you could clarify that. Presumably for locations south of the equator, you have to have uh, a minus sign to make it clear that it's it's south? Yes. Okay, good. And it's, um, I think it's south and west, Jason, is that right? Or, I don't know. I, I, believe, I believe that's correct, yes. Okay. Um, but the biggest, it's the most common typo that we see for latitude and longitude is people not including the minus sign. 
So um, I'm fairly certain it's west of the meridian and south of the equator. Those are your minuses. So um, existing object references. So that's if you're referencing a sighting that already exists or an individual that already exists, make sure that you get their name exactly. Um, there's certain processing that happens on a sighting name, for example, that you might have typed in something one way and then it came out another because we removed white spaces or special characters. Double check the name before you put it into the bulk import if you're trying to reference the same location or the same object. Um, case sensitive fields are called out in the wiki and most of them it's stuff like genus is capitalized and specific epithet isn't, but there's also some where if you're setting the state of the encounter, such as unapproved, approved, or unidentifiable, that has to be all lowercase. Like we don't check for all forms of capitalization within it. So if something goes screwy when you're trying to put it in and you you get the the notice that it didn't recognize what you put in, check the wiki, see if it's a case sensitive field. Most of them aren't, but there's a couple few. Um, and then there are some fields that can cause confusion. We have an encounter field that does the same thing as the marked individual field that I showed you. Uh, we encourage the marked individual one because its use case is a lot more clear, but the other one is still supported. So if you put down two of them, then it can cause misassignment of which individual the encounter gets associated with. Um, if you have questions, come to community. We will help. We recognize that there are some wibbles and wobbles that you'll need help getting through. And there we go. We'll, we'll be there and we will help you get through them. Um, the field explanations are at the same location for the general how-to that I've provided. I am planning on splitting those out to be slightly more understandable because right now it's a really, really, really big long page, but um, that's where it's at right now. So I'm leaving it as is. Um, that's everything that I have. I do want to call out the tip from Marcelo that is in the chat where file naming a way to avoid overlapping of things is to start them with dates. It's a very good point. Um, that's more of a process thing for you to adopt than something that we can enforce, but it's a great call. So thank you for posting that. Um, and I think that's it from me, unless people have more questions or anything else that we can talk through. Hi, Tanya. Um, thank you so much for putting this together. I just had a quick question. When you have multiple uh, media assets, they're going to be uploaded and you have your two columns or however many columns you've got media assets for. Um, if you do have one encounter where it only has, say, one media asset, do you leave those other columns blank? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Diana? Hi, thanks. Um, just picking up on Marcelo's suggestion and some of the chat that Andy and I have been having um, on the side as we've been getting excited about all the opportunities that are possible within Wildbook. I wondered whether it might be an interesting idea in the future to have some kind of webinar where people talk about some of those processing things that they do that make the whole um, workflow from data collection on the boat, the data archiving to uploading to Flukebook work more smoothly so that you can streamline things and, and cut down on different processes. Obviously, we're not gonna get into that tonight, but it just seems like a lot of us are doing similar work and it would be great to, to share ideas on, on how we can streamline things. I would love to do that. Um, hosting a panel like that would probably, I want, these meetings to become more regular and do them at different times so people can you know not be on at 1 a.m if that's where they live so um especially something like that that could be hosted in multiple times where we wouldn't necessarily be guiding it or we could just you know be on and help set it up or that kind of thing 
I'm all for because us being Portland restricted does cause some issues with that. So um, basically, if anyone likes the idea and wants to be part of it, feel free to email me um, and we might send out a call for volunteers to do that kind of panel work and we can get that going. Cool, thank you. Yeah, for sure. Anyone else? All right, um, I think that's gonna do it for this meeting. Thank you all for coming and participating and hopefully I, you know, was at least moderately understandable, but if not, we've got plenty of resources that you guys can work with. So thank you. <laughs>